Uh, well, good evening. My name's John. Uh, if I haven't met you before, please keep that passage open. We're going to be looking uh, closely at Psalm 38 together tonight. Well, one night a boy uh, puts on his favourite wolf costume and he transforms into an untamable beast. And to discipline him, his mum sends him to his bedroom without dinner. But it doesn't work. No, that wild thing simply becomes wilder. His grey bedroom transforms into an imaginary world as he sails off to visit uh, full of other wild beasts. And he's crowned as their king. And he orders them to howl and dance and climb and parade around. He finally calls everything to a close and sends everyone off to bed without dinner. And he's left alone again, wanting to be where someone loves him best of all. And so, after smelling something good across the ocean, he hands back his crown and he sails home to find his dinner, what his mum had lovingly made him all along, waiting for him and still hot. Now, if you're wondering where that's from, it's the storyline of my favourite picture book, Where the Wild Things Are, by Morris Sendak. You might have read it as a kid. It follows a child processing their emotions about being disciplined. And we see at first that they're angry. They try and escape. They, try and, they want to be king. They try and be their own king. But they quickly realise that actually being, fun, uh, being angry sorry, isn't fun at all. They're all alone. And mum maybe was right all along. And they should apologise and come back to her because she does love them best of all. And Psalm 38, uh, thanks Tashi for reading that for us, like where the wild things are, gives us another king's experience of being disciplined. And this time being disciplined by God. And it's a real king. It's King David the one uh, anointed by God to lead his people Israel. Now, talking about God disciplining someone, it's tricky and it's sensitive. So we need to step carefully here. And in order to do this, we're going to think about this question as we make our way through the psalm. What do we need to remember when God disciplines us? And actually, that's partly what the psalm's title is about. As you might have seen there in uh, Psalm 38, at the beginning it says, for the memorial offering, or more literally, cause to remember. You see, David wrote this psalm for Israel to cry out to God to remember them. And as they sang it, they would remember why God is disciplining them and who would save them. And so when God disciplines us the psalm helps us to remember as Israel did and turn to the only one who loves us best of all. Well, so what do we need to remember when God disciplines us? First, we need to remember that God is angry at our sin. If you've got Psalm 38 on you, look down at verse 1 with me. David begins by saying, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. You see, like Psalm 6, another song full of pain, David begins by crying out to the one that he has a relationship with, the one whose name he knows, Yahweh, the Lord. It's a plea for God's discipline not to stop, but for God to show mercy instead of anger and wrath. But you might be wondering, why is David worried that God is disciplining him out of anger? And it's because he knows what human anger is like. Now, hands up, I can see a couple of you on the screen. Hands up if you have heard of what a rage room is before. Yep, I see a couple of thumbs up and hands up. Good job. Well, they were all the rage, so to speak, last year, to get my joke in there. They are purpose-built rooms for smashing things. You pick up your sledgehammer and you smash everything in sight. Now, it's great in theory, right? 
You know that printer that never works in the office? See you later, smashed. That one clean plate that won't fit in your microwave? All gone. Maybe that's just an indication of how my cleaning habits work uh, in the Breen household, but that's another point. The problem with rage rooms is that they don't fix what caused your rage. They just probably leave you a little bit more violent. Now, if you're wondering, the newest one, if you want some therapy in that way, is to go to Wollongong, uh, or you might want to take a bougie trip to the Hunter Valley. They also have ones up there. Maybe have some wine and get your rage out that way. But that's the picture of anger that David fears God's discipline is like with those words in verse 1. In your anger, in your wrath, uncontrollable, unmeasured, destructive, and violent. And from David's perspective, that's what it's felt like. Verse 2, it's been like arrows that have sunk into him. Arrows that move quickly and silently and deadly, creating wounds so deep that they remain lodged in David. It's been like God's hand has come down on him. It's full weight pressing on him to crush him, like God is completely against him. But why is David being disciplined by God? Well, verses 3 to 5 give us the answer. David writes, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. You see, David realizes that God is rightly angry, but God's anger is different to human anger because it's controlled, it's rational, it's justified. God is angry because David has sinned, because David has chosen to reject God who made him and has always cared for David. And this is why God is disciplining him, because of his sin. See, God's right anger at David's sin in, has left him in verse 3 without any soundness or any goodness in his flesh, which he then repeats later uh, back, uh, down in verse 7, although now it's more literally his loins or his sides burn with pain as he's convicted of God's right and measured anger at his sin. And David realizes actually how, how uh, his sin, how, sin it, how deep it goes. It damages his bones, gnawing at them like a worm and, until there's no rest. It destroys the frame that's supporting his corrupted and sinful flesh. And verse 5, his, this flesh that's wounded stinks and festers with sores. Perhaps those created by God's hand or the arrows back in verse 2. Verse 6, God's right anger at David's sin has pulled him down, humbly bent him over, and left him writhing in grief all day long. Verse 8, he's feeble and all benumbed, he's pounded out of joint. His soul is groaning or roaring in a deep, hoarse voice, full of sorrow at his sin. This is what God's discipline of David has looked like. It's left the sinful man smashed into a palpitating pulp on the ground. Now that language, it's pretty graphic and confronting, isn't it? And it begs the question, have you ever felt like David does? Has the weight of your sin and God's right anger at it ever hit you like this? Well, maybe you know how far you've turned away from God. Maybe it feels like I do sometimes that I'm just dragging this guilt and shame around everywhere I go. Or maybe this is the first time you've thought about it. Maybe it's been like you've been sitting at the bottom of a pool, not feeling the enormous weight of the water on you. 
your sin and God's anger at it above your head. But now as you read these words in Psalm 38, you've been chucked outside the pool and you're trying to carry a bucket full of it all. But you, but you can't. It's too heavy. And you long for someone to carry it for you. Friends, that immense weight is why David begs God for mercy. Help me, God. You are rightly angry at my sin because I've, cho- uh, yeah, because I've chosen to reject you. But please don't rebuke me or discipline me like an enemy, like those you hate. Discipline me, but be gentle, for I am weak. Spare my life. Let your mercy quench the glowing coals of your wrath and anger at my sin. Don't let your rod of discipline turn into a sword of death. You see, Israel, they would call out to God with these words, begging for God to remember them, as they remember that God is rightly angry at their sin, and that is why they are being disciplined. So does God answer David's cry for mercy? Well, the psalm doesn't say. But followers of Jesus confidently know God's answer. You see, friends, God's answer is that Jesus has sung this psalm for us so that God will never discipline us out of anger and wrath. Although Jesus didn't commit any sins of his own, he willingly bore our sins on his shoulders as he walked to the cross and died there for our sin in our place, the death that we deserve. The Apostle John would write years later that Jesus did this to be the propitiation for our sins, that his death would quench God's anger and wrath at our sin once and for all. And that means that if we trust Jesus, we will never face God's anger at our sin because Jesus faced it for us. What an incredible comfort that is. This means that although God may discipline us today for our sin, it will never be out of anger and wrath. And we read a little bit about this earlier from the letter to the Hebrews, that God's discipline of us today, as we saw in verse 6, is because He loves us. We're His children. And actually, it's always for our good, in verse 10, so that we may keep turning away from sin and follow Jesus right until the very end, even if our suffering feels just as real and just as painful in verse 11. So if you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus, come to Jesus. Trust that he has lifted your sin off your shoulders, all the shame, all the sin, and put it on his shoulders, and he's carried it to the cross for you and to die for you so that you can say with confidence that God is no longer angry at you. Now, to be clear, we may still suffer for other reasons that has nothing to do with God disciplining us. Friends, we trust in a sovereign God who may have many reasons why something happens that we don't fully understand. And throughout the Bible, God makes it pretty clear, explicitly clear to his people when he is disciplining them for their sin. And sometimes all we can do is trust in Jesus' death on the cross when we cry out in agony. But if our pain is because God is disciplining us for our sin, we can trust that like David, God will reveal this clearly to us. So when God disciplines us, we need to remember that God is rightly angry at our sin. But on this side of the cross, we confidently know that Jesus has faced God's anger for us, so that God's discipline of us today 
is out of mercy and love for us, not anger and wrath. But actually, the psalm doesn't end there. Because David also wants us to remember that we can't save ourselves from God's discipline. You see, with God's heavy hand upon David, because of his sin, who will save him? We'll look down at verses 9 to 10 with me. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. You see, David trusts that he is deeply known by God, that God does hear his soul's half-attempted words, full of tears, utterly broken by his sin, how he longs for a reset button, for his suffering to end, and he knows just how helpless he is how his heart throbs or palpitates, it runs to and fro, not knowing what to do, and that his own strength has failed him, that God's discipline discipline of him has left him knocking at death's front door as the last lamp of the night is about to go out in his eyes. You see, David can't save himself from God's discipline of his sin. So will his friends? Well, no. Verse 11, what do they do? They stand aloof from my plague or condition. See, actually, they're close enough to look at David, but actually far enough not to look after him. And what about his family? No, they stand far, even even further away. They stand far off. Meanwhile, David's enemies, well, they're wanting to kill him. And they're laying snares or traps in verse 12 for him to fall into. See, while he mourns all his sin, all of it, all day in verse 6, they plot his end and make false accusations against him in verse 20. God's discipline of David for his sin has left him vulnerable to attack and utterly helpless to defend himself. No one not himself, not his friends, not his family, can save him. And Israel, well, they would sing this psalm feeling exactly like their king. And years later, well, another man would sit in a dark garden feeling like David and knowing what awaited him. You see, in this garden, Jesus would fall on his face and cry out to God from deep within his soul to be saved from where God's right anger at our sin would take Jesus to the cross. But no one would save him. Jesus' enemies, seeking his life, well, they would be laying traps and circling like vultures over a dead carcass. And he would soon be put on trial against false accusations, but never speak back like David in this psalm. And he too would soon be completely abandoned by his closest friends and family and be put on a cross to be crucified. They would stand at a distance as he hung there, looking at him, but not looking after him. And with his final breath, he would cry these words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would feel utterly helpless and abandoned in death. Jesus went through what David Israel, and what we experience when God disciplines us, what we feel, an utter helplessness to save ourselves from our pain and our agony. So what do we do when we feel like this? When we're burdened by our sin, what do we do? Well, 
David's answer is also the last thing we need to remember when God disciplines us. We need to remember to turn to God alone to save us when God disciplines us. And look down at me at verse 15. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. David turns and he waits for Yahweh, the one he has a relationship with, to act. He clings to the hope that the one who has been disciplining him all along is the only one who can save him, particularly from his many mighty enemies that are now beginning to rejoice over his suffering at the end of this psalm. But he doesn't just wait. No, he does more. He also confesses and apologizes in verse 18. And he cries out one last time in verses 21 to 22. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. It's a desperate cry for help. Please, forgive me, God. I am sinful. I am sorry. Don't leave and forsake me. Come and help me, God. Israel would cry out to God with these words, confessing their sins to God and begging for God to be close and to save them. And when our pain is great and we long for it to end, we can cry out like they did. Our sin should grieve us to our core like it did for David and lead us to say sorry to God, to confess or to admit what we've thought, said and done in rejecting God and wait for God to save us from what we're going through. You see, waiting patiently and confessing our sin to God is part of a healthy lamenting or grieving of our sin. It shows that we trust that our God will save us and will forgive us. It shows that we know that He is, and we know that He has ultimately come to us in the person of Jesus, who was forsaken on the cross so that we will never be forsaken who died for our sin today, uh, died for our sin, sorry, so we can be forgiven today and can cry out for mercy as deeply loved sons and daughters. Friends, we will shortly say a prayer of confession together and the words are up on your screen. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to read those words to yourself. Friends, are you ready to come and ask God for forgiveness? Come and humbly confess your sin to God tonight with confidence that Jesus, in that through Jesus' death, you are forgiven. We see Psalm 38, it presents and it paints a confronting picture of a man trying to process God's discipline of him. And at the beginning, I asked a question to help us to understand God's discipline. What do we need to remember when God disciplines us? And this psalm, Psalm 38, shows us that we need to remember that God is angry at our sin and that we can't save ourselves from God's discipline. But ultimately, we should turn to God alone to save us that we should humbly confess our sin and patiently wait on God to act, which he did by, ultim- by sending Jesus to die in our place for our sin. That means that when God disciplines us today, 
It's only out of love and mercy for us as His children. Friends, we can sing this psalm. We can make up the notes as we go, knowing that Jesus has ultimately sung it for us. Jesus will get us through it all if we come and kneel at the foot of the cross and ask for forgiveness. How marvellous and how wonderful is our Saviour's love for us. As the King of the Wild Things would say, Jesus is the one who loves us best of all. Let's pray together.